Oh, oh, I'm Alex is chairing. I'll hand over to Alex. Yeah. Great. So thanks everyone. Let's get started again. Um, so the next question is on the what we talking about uh, phenomenological models of disease progression. Um, so looking more at high level biomarker data and trends, um, how they evolve with um, these timelines. Uh, we've got three speakers. The first is Bruno, and then we've got uh, Pete, and then finally we've got uh, Constantine and the last one speaks from um, uh, Caroline, the Caroline Jones Institute, um, and they'll be presenting online. Um, so, yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, so, we've got an hour. Yeah, great All right, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for inviting me. And uh, let me get started. So, my name is Bruno Jignac, and I'm working at Portland State University. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, heterogeneity in the progression of AD. Right. Um, sorry, no. let's just put it on the screen so that the mouse goes back. Okay. Should be in your okay. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. okay. Um, so part of the talk has been already uh, already discussed, so we go we go fast on some other side. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Alzheimer's disease model modeling. Let's keep going. Uh, yeah. Here we go. Here we go. And uh, okay. And so I'm going to do a, a little bit of history about this template model. I was there uh, some time ago. Uh, I think I first started on this in 2010, kind of like by chance. Uh, when, uh, like, uh, so I was at the Johns Hopkins at the time, and there were some former students that came and uh, they were working for uh, Pfizer at the time. And he told us, uh, hey, you know what? We have a, uh, so we study Alzheimer, but just there are three stages, right? Uh, uh, normal MCI and AD, and this is the way uh, 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 all of that data set is organized. And can you get us something uh, a little bit better than, than, than that? And so we begin to think about it and show we have, you know, a few days, uh, their funding was, was going out, you know, they had, they had money, but for a few days, and then that's it, it was over, uh, kind of uh, end of the year, the deadline, and, and we proposed something totally stupid, and that ended up to be funded and end up working on this for 12 years. All right. Uh, okay, and so I'm going to tell you about the heterogeneity, so some of the things that the model that I developed and some other could not tackle and then i'm going to tell you about a totally different way to do things so a few years ago uh, i i saw everything uh, 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 away and uh, try to restart fresh and i'm going to tell you about that uh, okay so this is about alzheimer's disease and you can read but most of you know that just there are these two words that are going to come back so the uh, so certainly the uh, uh, beta amyloid plaque and the uh, and the tangles, the tau tangles. Um, and uh, these are the three data sets I'm going to discuss today. Certainly, the uh, admin that that was uh, 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 extremely important for uh, 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 a very long time, and, and, and that continue to, to be. But I'm going to tell you about two other the data sets I'm involved with, which are just fantastic data sets because they are. Uh, really about the beginning of the of the disease. So in particular, the first one is a RAP data set. So RAP goes for uh, Wisconsin uh, repository for Alzheimer's disease, and it follows subject. I think that's, oh, yeah, there we go. That's strange. And it follows uh, subject that are aging sub subject and that are uh, son and daughters of people with Alzheimer's disease. And the, uh, the, the third one is the VLSA, so it should be conducted uh, uh, in Baltimore and that follow also uh, a large study that, that uh, 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 follow aging uh, people. And that has a lot of things, including uh, a lot of measurement, right? Including a lot of Im imaging. Uh, all right. So these are some of the questions in uh, clinical AD that we know all some of the scientific question. Uh, um, then, uh, you know, drug, uh, uh, question about uh, drug and treatment development, uh, public health, medical care, you all know about that. But to, to, today I'm going to talk a little bit about 
the last one, which is uh, heterogeneity. And uh, but then, what do we mean? Uh, and and uh, when I when I went to uh, uh, search, uh, you know, heterogeneity and AP, actually we find very different, uh, very different idea, very different concept. I, I tried to put uh, uh, to. Uh, 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 Three points here about that. So, so the first one is um, hey about disease progression. So heterogeneity in the fact that uh, time to event is different for different sub subjects. Uh, say two subjects that uh, maybe at the same age are amyloid positive, are tau positive. It turns out they're going to develop cognitive symptoms uh, possibly very differently. So this is a form of heterogeneity. And I think this is one that uh, some of our community is tackling with uh, disease progression model and, and uh, we'll review that. Uh, then there is the idea that, hey, actually there is a, there, there are multiple of the disease. Uh, and and uh, what might be needed is some kind of a clustering of uh, a kind of single uh, progression. And then there is maybe uh, another idea that, uh, oh, actually, it might be even more complicated than that, and things might be uh, uh, in a continuum, and people might have several of these subtypes, for example. So there is the old combinatorics of that. And, and uh, so, so this, is, this is what I'll, I'll tackle. I'll, I'll, I'll try to at least find a way to get at discussing this kind of situation, uh, some kind of computational tool that, that we could use for this. And, uh, but so certainly, so I'm not going to talk about the, 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 the uh, uh, multiple disease progression, the clustering models and so on. Just want to cite the paper from uh, uh, Alexandra. And uh, I, I've tried, actually, for, uh, I've tried to put the, the, you know, all the authors of this paper here, but it couldn't fit on time. So I'd like that the, all the people who are from, well, on this paper, raise their hand. All right, I got four here. Okay, all right, all right. I think there are about 20, right? All right, and that's a fantastic paper. All right, so let, let me continue. Okay, sure, it's here, right? The few jacket. And, and somehow, if our community had really succeeded, it would not be here anymore. That would be one of all, you know, creation. <laughs> so let's, let's be aware that we are very far away. Uh, so, yeah, so one thing that particularly interested me was, uh, yeah, so this. This time here, right? Uh, according to Jack, there is really a, a, a whole range here, for example, and, and of, of possibility of when when uh, dementia is going to occur, even with individuals that are already uh, uh, amy amyloid positive and, and two positive, uh, and, and so this is one form of heterogeneity. And uh, okay, and and I think that uh, our community has been uh, uh, pretty good at at, at trying to get at this, try to have some computational model to, to address these kind of things. And so I'm going to first to uh, um, talk a little bit about this, uh, what I call template model of this is pro progression, right? So the central notion here is a, a continuous clinical stage. And when I say continuous, surely there are, there are models that use uh, a discrete, uh, but okay, even in the in the continuous, right, we work for the computer, so we get to discretize also anyway. But uh, okay, some sometimes they are uh, a little bit different uh, model because, uh, um, you know, Markov chain, you know, like discrete Markov chain on one on one side, on another side, maybe uh, other kind of continuous model, uh, 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 a little bit, uh, a little bit different, but any, anyway. Uh, my, my example are, are from the continuous uh, 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 clinical, uh, uh, clinical stage. All right, um, so the, this clinical stage is described by one or two uh, random effects. Uh, so typically the, the time of onset and possibly the speed of progression. Uh, but some models have been developed with more than that, with a poor kind of time warping. Uh, of the age of the subject to like the uh, some kind of uh, Alzheimer age, um, and then uh, and then uh, the, the uh, expected value of each biomarker is described as function of this, right? Which is a uh, uh, very different from the model that uh, uh, are used in uh, by the biostatistician, uh, where their random effect are only on the vertical axis, right? Uh, and and they, and they are not on this horizontal axis correspond to uh, uh, what is uh, the onset and what is the speed of progression. 
And surely uh, this might not be enough and, and eventually additional random effects are, are used uh, describing individual variability of the biomarker. And then, uh, and, and then there is not. And uh, I believe even for this model, uh, 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 a sign that we are not done yet, uh, just, just on top of the fact that uh, we still look at the big junker, is the fact that in the biostatistic uh, world, this model have not yet uh, 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 are not yet fully used. Uh, we are the R package. We are the you know really the tool that make that people in the biostat culture use this thing. I'm not sure. I mean, there might be development, or maybe I just don't know about that. But uh, right, I think there is uh, some work to be done. So I want just to show you some example. This is from a, a, a colleague of us, Michael Dodonadu. And by the way, Michael is a member of the uh, ADNI Biostat Corps, and he's doing a great job there. And so that's one of the uh, early uh, uh, models that he developed, and he was also here. Which, yeah. So you're saying biostats people aren't doing this, and then straight away there is one. <laughs> Actually, when you see what he's doing, for example, when he's studying uh, sample size, you know, how to compute sample size, still using, yeah. he's still using, you know, the, the linear mix effect model. You know, this is the case. They are, they are, not, they are not using that, right? Yeah. Okay. And so this is one of the first uh, yeah, model that Michael Donoglu came with. So there is here, there is one uh, 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 random effect per subject that uh, has to do with uh, uh, the, uh, uh, just the time, just the, the uh, uh, onset time. And so just with this, you can show, you know, a collection of biomarker as functions of here, years to 80th uh, percentile on uh, CDF sum of boxes. And uh, and really the big game, I think it's when I go from. Okay, what is uh, the, the big game is that if you look at the vertical variability, it is reduced a lot compared that you know to a, a, a naive you know horizontal sc uh, scale where you would look at the age of the subject, for example. All right, that was one example. Um, uh, this is one example from uh, uh, some of uh, my work, but the work of, actually, uh, the, the work of uh, Murad Bilgo uh, does something uh, a little bit sim similar. Here we have, uh, so the horizontal, there, there is also just one, one parameter on the horizontal scale, and same thing, we can uh, reduce a lot of the variability. Uh, another work of Murad on imaging this time, so here there is one biomarker for box cell if you want. And when you go from top to bottom, you see the way uh, amyloid, uh, PET amyloid uh, develop in the brain. Uh, and this is a recent model from uh, uh, our friend in Paris, uh, uh, Cobal here, and where uh, they have a pretty uh, comprehensive uh, model looking at a large collection of uh, biomarkers. And they have actually a, a pretty large number of random effects uh, also in this model, also on the vertical axis. Um, okay, but then, um, but then there is evidence for heterogeneity. And, and as you've seen in all of this model, uh, how do you model heterogeneity? Okay, so maybe if we go back to the last one, um, uh, there, are, there are random effect on the on the vertical axis. Might, it, it means that for certain individual, the ordering of biomarker, if you wanted to uh, binarize, if you want a biomarker being uh, negative or, or or active, if you wanted to binarize, this order might change because of this random effect. But it's still a random effect. That means it doesn't characterize really a, a qualitatively different disease progression. Uh, and and uh, and the and the posterior distribution of this uh, of this random uh, effect are uh, typically normal. So you, you do not really uh, uh, this model are not uh, uh, designed. I mean, you might detect you might detect that there is something that you have not captured if you analyze uh, 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 if you analyze the residual from the model. You might detect that something went wrong, but they are not really designed to accommodate the fact that there is heterogeneity. And there is heterogeneity in Alzheimer. Um, uh, as we know, there is a, there is a, a principal uh, uh, amnesic version, uh, but there are also some non-amnesics. This is 
This is well known and, and, uh, and well documented. Also, there is uh, uh, you know, the presence of uh, neurovascular disease. Uh, it begins to be studied now uh, more systematically, and people begin to, to understand and to look at the interaction with, with other. Um, so in today's proposal, I'm going to do uh, so start back from scratch, right? So we get data in the form of biomarker, longitudinal data, and what are we going to do? And, and we don't want to make the hypothesis that there is a single disease, a single disease progression. So instead, um, what are we going to do? We're going to fit a model directly on the set of biomarkers, longitudinally. It's going to be a, a dynamical system. And then we're going to, uh, in the second step, maybe try to analyze it. And, 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 and from this, using tools like k-means and, and principal component analysis and possibly also dimension reduction uh, uh, tools in order to identify uh, other subtypes or, 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 or uh, what is going on. Okay, so this is the little tool I'm, I'm conveying um, you to look at. So I'm going to use ordinary differential equation to do that. So these are the people that work on this. We have a preprint at this time and uh, we have some sponsors. All right, and uh, so the idea come from uh, very old ideas, right, to, to use a uh, use vector field. Build a vector field and try to explain how biomarkers are going to change in time. And this idea surely be, can be, uh, you know, uh, 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 brought back to, to Darcy Thompson, you know, that uh, generate this vector field that act on the, on the background space here and any shape that is here moves. And, uh, and more recently, certainly the, the work on the uh, 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 LGMM, right? That, that uh, uh, computer deformation to show how a hippocampus uh, can be deformed from a, a standard uh, uh, template to the hippocampus of, of a given person. And then from this deformation, we can try then to understand it. All right, and so we're going to do this, but not in this space, but in the space of biomarkers. All right, and I'm going to illustrate this uh, in one dimension. And in one dimension, actually, uh, there is an equivalence with the, the template model that we have seen and so on. But uh, um, I think it is uh, interesting to look at. So this is uh, the, the, the beautiful data, uh, PET data, PET amyloid, from this two study I told you about. This is the VAR study on the left, and the uh, um, uh, the LSA on the right, and you can see there is a there is some longitudinal data that is uh, available. The threshold here correspond to uh, uh, amyloid positivity. Um, uh, it's actually uh, computed during uh, using a clustering algorithm, uh, uh, so it's not a medical thing. But, okay. Uh, all right, and so this is the original data. data. And uh, what we're going to do here is just we're going and we've seen the plot of, of, of this kind of thing. We're just going to plot the slope with respect to the thing itself. So the 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 the, the pentamiloid and the slope of the pentamiloid. All right. And and as you can see, okay. So here you have all the subjects that do not accumulate. You know these big blobs. But then for the subject to accumulate, you can see that one kind of kind of fit. You know some some kind of some, some kind of uh, curve. And uh, really, this is a very simple uh, uh, differential equation here with the function f being a quadratic one. And if f is a quadratic here, that, that tells you exactly that uh, the uh, uh, I mean, I mean, ability grows as a, as a sigmoid function, okay? So with this simple model, actually, it's, uh, it's surprisingly good. So what I've done here is that um, so this is the sigmoid, okay? You see here, here, it's a little bit different because the, the protocol from the studio is a little bit different. And here is the data. What I've done is that because it's a differential equation, surely there are just two things to characterize the full trajectory of the value of the amyloid for subject. You get this curve and you get the initial condition. 
And so here, I've moved all the subjects, assuming that they are the same initial condition. In this case, they should all line up on this curve. And you can see that, so there is still a translation, right? So don't be fooled. Uh, uh, but uh, still, for the subject that, that kind of accumulate amyloid, you see that the slopes are not too bad, okay? There are some problems, some are, some are something not so perfect, but some are not too bad. However, for the subject that are very low, here, you see that the slopes are, 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 are uh, not so good. Uh, one of the reasons here might be that just a protocol make that for the subject that are uh, just in this range of amyloid accumulation, the protocol is not very good. The, the protocol is made to, to detect some, you know, amyloid at, at a certain level. Its sensitivity is adjusted. All right. So this is fine. And so this is an example to show you uh, uh, just in, in 2D moving, you know, in dimension. So this was in 1D. This is in 2D. And this is an example showing this is a, a toy example that's a wonderful oscillator, but the kind of problem we're going to solve. So what is the kind of problem? So we're going to have uh, uh, data along some trajectory. And uh, uh, okay, in the case of uh, 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 one of these data sets we have seen, it's not the case that we have a lot of points along one trajectory. It's the case that we have few points along many trajectories. Because the idea is that the initial condition, essentially the genetic of the subject, are subject dependent, right? So it cannot be assumed to be the, the, the same. So we're going to have a, you know, a large collection of trajectories, a few points each, but hey, maybe if we can solve already this, then we get a step to solve uh, 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 a more difficult problem. So let's look at this one. So here we got, uh, so these are the points you see. And then uh, what we want to find are two things. There is the vector field and the initial condition. And uh, just to give you an example here, uh, the system has been kind of successful. There is some gray and black actually. So the, the black is the true vector field, the gray is the estimated vector field. And you can see that um, here, here we see uh, uh, on the two axis, horizontal and vertical, look at it uh, separately. So that's a function of time now. You see the, the data along each of the trajectory and you can see how, uh, you know, the model is able to a, predict, continue to predict correctly in time. So that's, in a sense, that's very different from the regression model, right? If we were to do regression, we might have gone correctly in the beginning, but then it would have gone, you know, down to a Bayesian prior, which is zero or something, okay? Well, here with a, you know, if you, if you get the dynamic, right? So uh, you, can, you, can, you can project into the future. So that's uh, potentially uh, very interesting. Yeah. So you're going to win the next round of the tadpole challenge? <laughs> sure, I'm real. Come on. What do you think? All right. And so, okay, so the only side where there is some mathematics, but so that we can essentially refer to it. So as I told you, we get data for a subject, as you know, we get, you know, uh, vector G is the, is the dimension, the number of biomarker we use, and then we get a certain number of uh, so subject is high, then we get the, you know, the data is, is like that. So we get a, a certain number of time points where we observe that. And, and uh, so in the background, this is differential equation. And, and uh, um, so one thing which is a bit uh, uh, challenging on the technical side is F. So we, we're not going to make it parametric. There's a lot of work in making parametric uh, 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 vector field, but uh, a we can say a we don't really know about it, so let's try to be non parametric and we're going to use uh, uh, the theory of uh, RKHS that, that uh, 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 actually has been well developed and, and allow us to use this in a, in a non parametric way. So that actually the number of parameters here is going to depend on the amount of data we have. All right, and uh, okay, so. Uh, um, some notes on what has been done for this, and there, there is actually a good, a good amount of work and, and algorithm. Uh, there are some success um, uh, in totally different domain. In um, some sort of success in uh, uh, actually uh, learning dynamical system for fluid dynamics. 
And uh, so that has started uh, maybe 10, 10 years ago, and this is very successful. It seems that uh, uh, now it might be easier not to design you know, precisely the equation uh, for how, say, uh, air is going to go around a wing, you know, or something like that. Uh, uh, some detail of it, but it might be easier to accumulate data and to learn. Uh, right. And uh, uh, um, um, okay, there are different kind of algorithms. There is a very interesting connection, uh, and I would refer to uh, the paper by Laurent Younes shortly. Uh, but also, the more the more well known is uh, actually the the. This paper called Double Ordinary Differential Equation that got, I think, the best paper at NIPS in 2018. And they explain actually how uh, essentially if you have a system of OD, right, and you kind of the way you generate actually the way you, you can do uh, estimation and the way you can do and even le 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 learning is uh, uh, closely related to how. Uh, uh, some some uh, special kind of deep neural net would, would work. Essentially, the different uh, 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 time step, say if you do uh, Euler integration, correspond to the different uh, depths in your net, net, network. Surely, the thing particular is that uh, the number of nodes uh, uh, per layer is the is the same, and the parameters are shared between. Uh, between the different nodes, actually, it doesn't have to be it depends if, uh, if there is a, a time which is involved in the system or not. But so it, con it connects to research in other domains that make that there are algorithms that are valuable and maybe we do not need to develop all, but nevertheless, we develop all. Okay, and so we, we developed a penalty method because we, all right, this is, this is the way we did, and this is a, a little bit of an example of the way. Of the way it works, and uh, so that at the first step, essentially, you the the the, the system you can see kind of fit the data really well. There are four trajectories here. Uh, the points correspond to the observation, and then the lines correspond to the fitted system. And but at the beginning, it doesn't enforce the fact that the uh, the uh, uh, trajectory uh, 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 correspond to an ordinary differential equation. And so slowly is going to enforce at the penalty and and uh, uh, slowly is going to enforce it. And at the end, uh, you can you can check that there is the same vector field that corresponds to the solution for all the trajectories. This is just a schematic. Some result. Um, uh, we are kind of on the bottom here. We are uh, on this example on the van der Poel. It turned out we do pretty well. Then there, is, there is a group that does uh, actually uh, 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 as well, I would say, uh, and uh, an algorithm that have been developed a few years ago. And it, it's, it's, uh, the modeling is very similar. It's kind of the Bayesian counterpart, so it uses a Gaussian process. Uh, and uh, but the optimization is not the same. It is inducing point. We do not have inducing point. We see it's a little bit better. But all right. It's about the same. And this is an example of result on a uh, special um, uh, on amyloid measure in a, actually here three different regions in the brain. And uh, just to kind of illustrate and in order to test also, we did that in order to test prediction, right? And so we can see the, the kind of estimated vector field so you have the three different regions. So this is the data, the estimated vector field. And you can see that we predict. Uh, so how we can read? You know, there is some some uh, some inflection in the in the vector field, and the inflection tells you that uh, hey, some region kind of accumulate amyloid before some other. Okay, and this was mostly used to to be able to test. So so typically we are given uh, so we train on maybe eighty percent of the, the data, and on twenty percent we are given just the first point of each. Trajectory, and we push it until the last observation, and then we compute the RNC between the last observations. And so this is what we did. This is an example of the vector field you can see more that are uh, superposed to the data. You see it's very smooth actually, and uh, this is some performance. So here we are. I think this one, and actually, you know, we are not so all, all the one in 
in a, 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 a bold place here are the same statistical performance. Uh, and there are some algorithms that we are not doing so well. Um, for the first example, that now are doing very well on this one. And, and reciprocally, uh, this, this one is the one with the uh, Bayesian um, uh, point of view. And some I working very well in 2D, maybe we have not been able to adjust it correctly, choose the parameter, but it's really it was not doing so well. We can push the dimension. Algorithm is still uh, 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 cubic in the number of dimension, so the completion, but now we can cubic to six biomarkers, seven biomarkers, or something like that. This is where we are. Um, okay, and so now let me uh, let me tell you about um, so some recent uh, data that uh, we got on the blood plasma biomarkers, and that you know is exciting a lot the uh, Alzheimer com com uh, community. So um, I'm going to show you um, some data on the RAP study. Uh, and uh, it's just part of the a subset of the uh, of the subject and time point have been sent to the lab to get uh, this biomarker. So here I'm going to show you just one study that use uh, four biomarkers. So one is the imaging, uh, the, the PET imaging, uh, and uh, and uh, we use it here because we, we kind of know it uh, pretty well. We have studied it before, and then we add uh, these three uh, plasma biomarker biomarker. So there is a this one is um, I think I'm not sure the name is correct here. Uh, so this one is a ratio actually of two uh, biomarker, 40 and 42. Um, but that should be uh, 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 highly co-correlate with uh, 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 amyloid. Then there is uh, GFAP. GFAP is a biomarker, uh, which is a, a indication of uh, astrocytic damage. Uh, astrocytes are uh, um, uh, involved in uh, uh, in uh, making that the synapse are working correct, co correctly, and uh, um, there might be uh, indication of possible inflammation. And then uh, a third one is called N NFL. And NFL uh, 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 is supposedly uh, uh, associated with uh, uh, axonal uh, de degeneration. So here is uh, just a little. Um, a figure that uh, shows this biomarker. So EBITDA 42 over EBITDA 40. I think this is what we have here. And so that corresponds to the, that is associated with the plaque. Uh, so the GFAP associated with the astrocytes. Um, and uh, right, I do not show you, we have some PITA also, but I'm on a much smaller set, so I do not. I do not uh, uh, show you that, and I show you the NFL associated with uh, degeneration in the, in the axons. Right, so we fit the model on this, and this is the uh, available the data. So as usual, so this is the age of the subject. Uh, so this one is the subset of the data that you have seen already, uh, uh, the, the peak global DVR, but just a subset for which we have the other one. Uh, as you can see, there is more, uh, I'm not sure exactly what has the, the, the way subject have been chosen, but uh, uh, I can see here that, uh, um, you know, there might be half of the subject that are amyloid negative and, and half of the subject that are amyloid positive. So, so this, is, uh, this is not uh, uh, what you would see in a real population for, for sure. Uh, so this is this uh, a beta uh, 44 over 40, and hey, we can see just from here that uh, 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 there is a change with age. Um, the GFAP is here; it seems to also increase with age, maybe with some, some kind of exponential shape, and the uh, NFL also. So here I'm showing you so the 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 data, and on top of the data, the fitted. Uh, trajectory. So you can see there is a good amount of smoothing that, that occurs, right? 
And uh, here, the way we show it, uh, the color corresponds to the trajectory. So here is this one blue corresponds to, to this. You see, there is a lot of noise data, but most of you work with actual data are used to, to this kind of things. And so this is what we see in one D. So now I'm going to um, I'm going to do a little bit more. So since I have this tra trajectory, uh, 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 what I can do is I can do uh, what is called a kernel PCA. That is, I can essentially define a similarity, right? Uh, before, when I have just a few points on each of these biomarkers for each subject, uh, it was difficult to establish similarity. Now you have the full trajectory between, so, so here, about 50 and 80 years old, right? The estimate trajectory, so I mean, that's not perfect, but from this estimate tra trajectory, I can I can compute a similarity, okay? And using this similarity, now with a similarity, we can do a principal component analysis, we can do k-means and things like that. And here, what you see is, uh, so I've done the PCA, and these are the loading on the first principal component. And the first principal component takes on its own about, you know, 70% to 90%, depending on, on exactly uh, some difference here, but uh, it takes a good amount. And that, and that tells you already that uh, just there is kind of one direction along which you, you explain most of this data for this four value biomarkers, right? So coming back to kind of the template model. And you see the loadings here on this first component, and you can see in PDVR that the loading, so it goes from blue is on one side, maybe negative or positive, it doesn't matter, you can change that, but, and then the, the deep red is on the other side. So you can see that it's not exactly the case, but essentially this direction correspond to essentially organizing the subject from the one that do not accumulate to the one that accumulate a little bit to the one that are going to accumulate along, along their life. Okay, so it's a one characteristic for a subject, even just the uh, observation. And then we can see on the other one, so the same like the, the same color are used. But now we can begin, so, so the interesting part is going to see the correlation and, and try to, to appreciate a little bit of this vector field in more dimensions. And so this is what uh, we try to do here. So here it's a it's a it's a animated thing. So could you try to animate? I think if you click on one, of, yeah, this thing would be good. Yeah, all right. And so you see at a, so there is a, a certain number of image per year, right? So you see each trajectory corresponds to a trajectory of one subject from about fifty to eighty years. Okay, and um, okay, what you can see. So let, let's look at this 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 one. So this is the 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 the, the pet, right? The pet amyloid, and and this is the amyloid from the plasma. So and the color are the same that on the on the previous slide. So the say the, the the blue up there are the subject that essentially do not accumulate pet. Okay. And they do not change much. And then the deep red are the ones that accumulate a lot of that. And if you if you look at them, there is kind of this curving here that show you that most of the subject, actually what happened is that they begin to accumulate. So you begin to see in the plasma, you know, increasing amount of accumulation before you see it in the pet. And actually it's going to level off. At a certain point, because you see all this curve, they 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 become almost horizontal. At some point, is that it level off at at certain point the uh, uh, accumulation that we see in the plasma level off. Okay. So this is what we see here. So let's try to see uh, a few others. Um, I think there is something that might be interesting um, in terms of uh, heterogeneity. Uh, possibly here. So here we see uh, 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 a beta. So this is the uh, 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 amyloid from plasma and uh, GFAP. And uh, so here it, it seems that there are uh, 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 um, uh, some heterogeneity visually. 
And then this curve, it seems that the uh, uh, GFAR that might correspond to, uh, to inflammation uh, is going to be different from different subjects, is going to be like later on in life. And, uh, and uh, right, might correspond to some kind of uh, 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 heterogeneity and, and, and something to follow. All right. Okay, and in summary, so uh, try to address the question of heterogeneity in aging. We review a few template-based disease progression methods. Uh, so we have developed some methods. So, so the idea as I told you is to proceed into steps. A, they just model at the level of the full collection of biomarkers that we have. And maybe in the second step that we have just, you know, barely uh, 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 scratched, which is to then do some analysis there and try to see indeed if there is a single disease progression, if there are some type, if there are things of interest. All right, happy to finish early. And thank you so much for your attention. And thank you for your brief presentation. This one to ask for your LTE, how do you define the initial values? So how do I define it? So the initial value is the value, so it's a it's a vector, right? And it do has, you know the parameters or do you just select the so we learn, we, we estimate that. So we estimate this, we estimate two things. So these are the parameter at a given age, right? And this is the initial value. So there is one value per biomarker. So it's a vector of dimension, the number of biomarker, initial condition, together with the vector field. And we estimate both as we go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for your the question is, when you model your, do you have a very high difference of the question? That is that it is um, your real data. Yeah. But we need each other or not? I mean, like, do you have, like, the difference of the that or that? That's the point. Yeah. Like, do you have interaction between biomarkers or? Right. So each biomarker, biomarker so the, the gradient, the slope, for each biomarker is a function of the value of all the biomarkers. So, so this, this vector field F, you know, it goes from RG to RD. So it's a map that uh, explains the slope of each one as function of all the other one and time if we want, or if you want to, if there are some other covariate, they, they could come there. Right, yeah. Right. So you could try to enforce this kind of modern modernity. Right. Right. Of the, uh, like right. System. Yeah. So it turns out that the world of uh, uh, RKHS that that we use uh, is very is very nice. So that you essentially choose a, a kernel and that define a collection of functions and you can define polynomial one, for example. It's very easy, or you can uh, use some kernel that are going to, uh, for example, the Gaussian kernel, which is the most well known and the one used here, and make that uh, the set of function is a set of uh, essentially smooth function. Uh, the smoothness is characterized actually by the kernel and uh, and uh, and the lens that you put in the in the kernel. And from this, you can control the regularity of your function. But there are also some kernels that are studied. There are some kernels that, that provide some vector field with some particular property. Some are curl free, some are, you know, there is a good amount of, of science that we can use. Uh, and it's a fairly, uh, it's a fairly uh, well developed and, uh, and uh, 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 set of models that allow for various uh, form, including par par parametric form. But it's certainly a good form. Right. Because I mean, it's so I mean, it's 
from the very beginning when we're yeah. talking about these food based based models that you can yeah. cause more and more random effects and so on. And right. well, I guess that in that case, like the more random effects you add and the more parameters you need to be estimated, right. the more yeah. they just fire yeah. the model becomes. So remember, like in the Mike Donnelly's paper, they did a bit of a study of identifiability right. between just time sheets that they found it mm. identifiable. But essentially, when you add more parameters, it yeah. becomes harder to. Right. And do you like do you have any feeling or do you have any results or you yeah. guys want to see a problem in this case? Like yeah, so we have a CRM at home. We have a CRM that guarantees um, that uh, uh, we can identify the trajectory when we get more and more uh, observation within a given amount of time. So the the you know it's it's the very same model that I use for regulation uh, SVM, and so we use the same tool uh, that are used for SVM to uh, prove uh, uh, you know asymptotic result that you do not have curves of dimensionality uh, that uh, we use here and that that function. However, I'm sure in practice it's always a question, and and uh, if I can uh, yeah answer well also on the on the random effect actually. They are, they are fairly few. So what are the random effects here? Uh, the initial condition. This is what is subject dependent, but now the vector field is the same for everybody. All right? It is a bit too simple to be true, but uh, this is what we get for now. Okay, uh, kind of following on from that. So uh, you mentioned this sort of having no hidden space. Was this sort of a, a very kind of aware conscious choice for sort of interpretability? Or more a kind of a modeling choice in that it makes sense for the ODEs so that the vector field actually makes sense in terms of modeling by and the dynamics or right. I think the uh, you know, um I think it's something very simple and, and surprisingly it has not been started, it has not been done uh, before. I think it's the uh, you know, kind of this modeling is what you know has been done in engineering for years, you know. Uh um you know, in the name of dynamic of system modeling, if you want. Uh, there is an idea also a little bit behind is that it might extend a little bit to uh, to all of medicine, I know. Uh, so, so one of the things that is interesting with this model is, is uh, the possibility to model uh, treatment or uh, environment, environmental effect as a control. So that subject uh, that would have treatment we would model this as a control, as a you know an added vector field, if you want that would that would change their trajectory, and it seems pretty simple, and it seems at least conceptually, and there are tools to do that. So this is also the way you know studying Parkinson, studying uh, uh, multiple sclerosis. Uh, surely for Alzheimer, we do not have really a, 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 uh, treatment for now, but it could be used uh, to model all the uh, environmental effects. Oh, <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you, and, and I was just wondering, you mentioned you know, some you know, biomarkers you didn't have a lot of data for, and I was wondering what your thoughts were on sort of missing data versus complete case analysis. Is there additional information that if you plug in and impute some of this data that you might be able to get out of uh, the trajectory? Right. So the way so the point of view here is we write a likelihood with all the data we got and we optimize it. That's it. Um, um, now um, so this is this is what we've done and uh, at least for now there is a I don't think there is a, a need or, or any uh, a good way to know to do imputation. Actually, this model might end up being a way to do imputation. Uh, if we know the trajectory for some biomarker, say we might be able to, uh, uh, and, and you know, uh, 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 we might be able to fill up some gaps actually in the data set. You give me the data set, there are a few gaps. I do my modeling, I have my trajectory, and uh, all right, these are my predictions. I can I can predict forward in time, backward in time, but also between even the, the time of observation. And uh, actually, when you think about it, that's the way um, that's the way uh, uh, it is currently used. I mean, one of the success maybe of our modeling is the fact that there is, there is uh, you know like the time from amyloid positivity has become a concept 
that is used in many papers now. And, and people recognize that it's something of great importance and compute it and it's, it's um, uh, uh, and it comes actually from, you know, from, uh, um, uh, from the work on template modeling and so on. But, but here, uh, the, the same idea could occur. You know, you could define on this trajectory, the time from whatever is of interest, the time from tau positivity. And then using a model like that, with some data, I can estimate it. Uh, maybe with just one point, I can estimate it for a subject and bam, I get an estimate. And now you can compare with co cognitive outcome or, or other other things. And that would be one of the means of this, this kind of model. Um, analyze plasma tended towards the horizontal. Um, I was just wondering what, whether that critique is anything like it is to be able to find things like this, the change in aviation plasma goes towards the mean as it deposits in the blacks, if the electron fluids. Yeah. If the change stops at a point, I'm wondering, can you tell us your thoughts about what that means? Yeah, no, no, I, I cannot. I cannot. I'm waiting for someone like you to do it. Regarding capturing heterogeneity. Hmm. What are your thoughts on clustering versus random effects? Perhaps we can explain more variance by just having that random effect, which in an OD could be an initial initial value, versus you know trying to do clustering and have some sort of clustered fixed effect around which you might do random effect on as well. Right. So I think so. The point of view, as you've seen here, is to say, hey, let's build the model at the level of the biomarker. So essentially, we uh, we create um, you know similarity. And so with this, we can, uh, hey, we can try essentially, and and, uh, and this is the way, uh, this is the way uh, uh, this would go, you know, in kind of a, a second step to identify uh, if there are clusters uh, or not. Uh, in terms of uh, random effect, uh, 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 we, we, we certainly for now miss some random effect. So we're following one track, which is to, to look at a stochastic differential equation so that Subject can follow a uh, different path, even if their initial condition are the same. So we'll see when it goes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Interesting. Yeah. So there is one of the methods that use uh, sparsity actually uh, that we compare against, and um, uh, that works pretty well. It's not built so. So in this method, so it's it's um, uh, it's called the gradient matching method. So the idea is to estimate numerically the gradient, right, uh, of each biomarker. So if you can do that, actually you can see that uh, after fitting the vector field, is just doing regression. Okay, and so within that, there is one method that uses sparsity. And uh, so that's the algorithm called CD, and they have been very successful uh, in fluid dy dy dynamics. And so certainly there is some something there. It seems to to work pretty well. We have not we have not done that, and uh, and uh, you're right. I mean, we, it would be great if we could uh, 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 get some kind of uh, causality. And uh, but we can also um, we can import uh, import by hand that that. A, just in order to explain the slope in this, you can just use this and that, and you know, so we can do all this kind of manipulation. We have not been there yet, but this is pretty well possible. Uh, uh, so um, it looks like the origin of the, the vector field that is the flow happened to be in a, uh, in a space where the actual points would be there 
which uh, uh, Jackson means that, that a, a small variation of, of, the, of the value could, should. Uh, yeah, chaotic dy dy dynamics. Here, here we go. And uh, yeah, why not? And actually, uh, you know, when we when we speak about heterogeneity, and uh, so certainly one of the explanation is that. Um, Hey, you know, some people have a, gen a different genetic makeup or uh, the air they breathe is different. But another one is just uh, almost randomness. Uh, the fact that indeed, uh, when you look even in one dimension, if you look at the system in one dimension from the annular population, and you can go back on the way to Okay, we. Even go, even go here. What happened is that the different, so, so I've not drawn them, but if you were to look at uh, uh, each of the curves corresponding to the subject, so they are all these, uh, 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 all these uh, uh, sigmoids, but at the, at the beginning, so very early on, here the, the horizontal axis is time from annular positivity. At the very early on, they are extremely close. And at a very early on, it's like a, it's like an epidemic uh, uh, dynamic. It's really hard to predict because there are some subjects that are a little bit higher. They are going to go extremely, you know, they are going to be very far, you know, and and and, and some subjects are not going to accumulate much. And if you go back in time, that's a very tiny difference between them. So I think we have to consider randomness also. The same way in cancer research, you know, randomness play a huge, uh, 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 as, as a huge impact on the development of certain can, can, cancer. And, and here, I think we have to keep that in mind. It's, it might not be that we are missing so many biomarkers. There might be some phenomena that are just random, you know, in, in the fact that some people are developing early and some people are de developing late. I used uh, a univariate differential equation, non-parametric differential equation model for that worked well in the Diane, the visual Alzheimer's yeah. cohort, and didn't do very well in that. Okay, all right. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. I think it's partly related to this, that the noise was quite a lot bigger. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we'll, with the multivariate, we'll give you this one. Yes. <laughs> Are there mechanisms for sort of width of vector field to understand the areas of it where there is less certainty or less like support for where the dynamics are going. Nice, nice. So there is so actually in the in the Gaussian process from formulation, uh, there is a covariance of operator there. So we could look at it. We have not. Nice. You want to start? Right. <laughs> yeah, one question. Oh, two last questions. Okay. Back to my initial uh, value problem. So if I understand correctly, you are also estimating the location of each subject on the world trajectory. Yeah. So I think then the solution will not be unique. So suppose you start from a larger initial value and the time for each subject to reach a big value. Specific value should be shorter. And if you start from a, you know, a, a lower value of the initial starting point, then the time should take longer. So yeah. uh, if you um, are estimating both parameters, then your yeah. solution will not be unique. How do you do you reach it? Uh, thank you. Let me show you like, uh... We can see actually now you can see the curve here. You can see the different subject, and they are each one, if you want, as its own sigmoid. And actually, in this case, they are all just translated from each other. So there is the same sigmoid, which is just tra translated. So you can, you know, you need a few data. So you you estimate the vector field for all of that. You need to estimate so for each uh, subject, uh, you need some logic in of that data. You know. If you're just one point, uh, I, I don't think you could do anything. Right? You would need some longitudinal data from each subject, but two points might be enough. Look, we have just a few, but we have a lot of subjects, and the vector field is common to all of them. And then for each subject, we need to estimate uh, just the initial condition. So in principle, we need one point. Surely there is noise, it's going to be a noisy estimator. If we have more points, we're going to have a better a refined estimate of initial condition. Um, but but it is not the same trajectory start from different uh, Right. So you see them the, the trajectory here. They are they are they are like that, you know, and they are all translated from each other. Yeah. 
I'm not sure I understand it. Maybe we can take this offline. I was just going to ask, just very quickly, uh, I was going to ask what was the motivation that the conversion of template models was yeah. the motivation that's in the program? Yeah, because, uh, okay, uh, uh, um, because I think uh, I, I, I didn't know how to extend it, and some other people have done it, but to, to, to deal with heterogeneity, I think it was. I, I felt we are stuck, or I felt it was just looking at all right, we have not just one model, we're going to have several, but then it feels that like the beginning of the disease, like everybody needs to be there. So are they going to there's some subject that needs to be several of the cluster? And like I didn't feel that was the right way to go. Certainly one possibility, but I I felt it was maybe better to um uh, uh, have something simpler also, and just uh, you know, there is no pre processing here, it's very, it seems very simple. And uh, I thought, hey, that's what I'm doing. Okay, okay.